Okay, so I think we are live again. Um, so for anyone watching, welcome back to the BitB Cash podcast. I think it's been like one year or so since I, um, maybe two years since I did one of these. Yeah, it's been a long um, time. We've got PSEC1, who is another head coach at BitB with me today. And then for our guest, we have Dom Choma from the US of A. So cheers for coming along, Dom. Thank you for having me, and, uh, and uh, good job for getting my name right without uh, on the first try. <laughs> I, was pan- I was actually panicking. I was like, I've never said your second name before, so let's see how it goes. Of all the things um, we talked about before the podcast, my pronunciation, my last name wasn't one of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we've heard for everything. But yeah, for, for a bit of introduction for Dom, he was a, um, a BitB student who joined us in 2020, I guess. Um, 21. March 2021. Yeah. March 21. And... Um, he was playing kind of uh, 50 and L at this point. Um, and he went on to become our most successful student ever. Uh, he played 700,000 hands at 12 big blind per 100, um, made 800 buy-ins um, at an average stake of kind of 750 to, to 1K L and playing as high as 2K L as well. So it was quite a successful uh, contract. And um, since then, he's gone on to, to cash the main event um, I'm actually not sure what place you came, Dom. Maybe you 216th. Know. 216th. I've had to answer that question a lot lately. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like coming, coming from 50 and L to achieving all this in like a year and six months, I think it's actually one of, the, one of the sickest stories I've ever heard in poker. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of um, talking more about it because I think like during the coaching of profits, obviously, like most of our conversations were about strategy, et cetera, not necessarily about um, kind of your journey in poker. So, yeah. Good to have you here anyway. And um, I guess to start, we can just start with like, yeah, do you want to talk through kind of how you got into poker and how, how it all started off? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm kind of a moneymaker baby, if you will. I, I My first memories of poker were watching it on uh, ESPN back in 2003, 2004, like when Chris Moneymaker won. And uh, like these have a weekly show with different like World Series events. So I remember, I think it was the year after he won, like every week there'd be a different tournament highlighted like you know they had like all the different games like Raz, Stud, Hold'em and I would just watch it I was kind of interested and in, you know I thought it was a cool game because like you know, it's a card game it's gambling but there's a skill element to it um and so I would like play with my friends and I played like play money online for a little bit and then um the first time I played real money was when I was 18 it was actually on a Friday night after we had a basketball game I was bored at home because we had a game the next day too on a Saturday for some reason and I like threw some money on full tilt poker and uh, I played like this $2 tournament. I was like, okay, this will be done by like midnight or 1 a.m. I ended up staying up till four and finishing second of the tournament <laughs> for like <laughs> four or 500 bucks, um, which I then blew in the next week. But yeah, that was kind of like my first I guess, start, if you will, with how I got into the game. And then I started playing for real money. But um, yeah, I guess the moneymaker boom was, I'm a product of that. Yeah. And then, and then like after, um, uh, there's a couple of things I want to ask here, but after the um, after the kind of original full tilt period, you you, you had like you weren't playing professionally low for a, for a long time, right? No, no, no. I mean, I played. I wasn't really profitable until I would say I was 20 or 21. Um, I didn't like lose a ton of money, but I wasn't like winning. And then um, I think my junior senior year of college, I started taking it a little more seriously as like a hobby and like as something where I actually did it for as a side income. Um, but no, I would say I was a recreational player up until 2020. Yeah. And this was all pre Black Friday as well, right? So it was like, um, well, this is yeah. all after Black Friday. After Black Friday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I was, Black Friday happened in the middle of my freshman year of like college mm-hmm. or university, as you call it. So my first year there. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, um, so you were, you were just playing online on like full tilt poker stars. Wait, I'm now confused because I thought after Black Friday, you couldn't play on full tilt in the UK. No, yeah. So US. I played on full tilt until Black Friday, like my senior year of high school, freshman year of college, yeah, and, yeah. like yeah. recreationally. Um, and then after that, I just played on various sites that, you know, all various underground sites that you're not necessarily, or that weren't legal, but yeah. um, like Bodog was the main one. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. The, the, the Black sites. And then um, how did you end up applying to... Um, applying to kind of bit B from through all this? Uh, so like I mentioned, I, until about the middle of 2020, I was a recreational player, like a serious recreational player. And then I decided to, I just didn't like what I was doing with my current or with my former job. And so I decided to play poker for a living. And 
the first like five months I, I was pro- making money, but I wasn't making enough and I knew I could be better. And so I, uh, I had tried like finding a, co- like, a group of guys like to study with and they're all like nice guys. And like, we learned, you know, I learned a little bit from them, but I never, I didn't feel like I got any better because nobody was really pushing me. And so yeah. I he said, okay, like I need to do something different. Here. I'm going to try and find the best players I can find. And so I think I just went through the, like the classifieds on two plus two for coaching listings. And I, I think I applied to like three or four CFPs, bit B and a couple others and um, got rejected at first, but uh, no, yeah, that's kind of how I decided to get on. I, you know, I just said, right, I'm just going to apply and see what happens. And thankfully I, <laughs> it worked out the way it did, but yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. just the two plus two classifieds is kind of how I found I, you guys. I think Donald, Donald um, rejected you and said you have to play like some more hands and, and, um, Bet, bet more basically right wasn't this the the general tip yeah i was way too nitty but yeah he, he yeah. basically was like hey like you know you when you put you you're willing to put the work in uh you're probably not where you need to be quite yet but we can revisit this in a few months and then like the thing that really stuck out to me was even like van he told me like, hey you know there's you know potential here but we need to see some more and he even gave me some you know tips on things i could improve and i, I asked him a few questions like through it was probably like five or six emails and i was asking him questions and he was answering them and giving me good answers and it, it stuck out to me because it's like, hey, I've never even paid this guy. I've never done anything for this guy. And he's still willing to at least give me the time of day to help me. You know, that's yeah. why. That's basically why it made me this, this like, okay, if I can get in with these guys, this, this is where I want to be. Because even when I'm, I haven't done anything for this guy, he's still trying to help me and help me, you know, get better when it doesn't do anything for him at this point. So, um, it, that that spoke a lot to me about like the, the group of or the character of Bit B and how you guys operate. I mean, and I'd say even since I joined, it's that's only, you know. I think that's definitely held true since I've joined too. Yeah, I think it's like, I mean, maybe it's so interesting what you think on this as well, Patrick, but it's always the big dilemma between like, you don't want to um, like share, like the kind of, if you were purely thinking about your own EV, you never want to share strategy with anyone for free, right? Because it's yeah. like um, a negative free will. But then at the same time, um, like I obviously, when I came up from poker, I had so much help from people for free who like have no reason to give it to me. Do you know what I mean? And like your life just, your life just isn't that nice if you go for it all trying to make sure like maximum. I know there are people at high six poker for sure who only care about making max EV decisions the whole time. But yeah. um, I think it's also like max EV in monetary terms isn't always max EV in like life terms, right? So 100%. like it does actually yeah. feel good to help people. And like one of the things I like the most about BitB is the success stories that we breed, you know, the uh, like when you do put in the work and like, yeah the guys have the results and whatever obviously it's a little bit different from helping people purely out of like kindness or whatever but like yeah, yeah going through life trying to maximize dollar ev in every node if you want to put it that way is just like it's not, not, the how road, not the road yeah. to a happy existence yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's, it, that's interesting too because I, i'm curious like your guys thoughts on this like in america a lot of it's like with your like career it's like how do you contribute to society and for poker players a lot of people struggle with it because how do we contribute to society? Like, you know, if you're a firefighter or you do, you do a job where you help others, you know, you're, that's how you contribute. So it's like, in a way, as a poker player, maybe if you, you know, that's kind of your way of contribute, contributing to society. Anyway, I don't know if it's like the same for you guys being from the UK, but I know in America, that's kind of like a, yeah, yeah. a big I, I think, thing, if you will. I, I actually have like a, a interesting anecdote on this where I like, um, when I was in my early twenties and I was like playing poker, not particularly well, but playing like 200 and and um, I had a girlfriend at the time and she always brought this argument with me. She was like, oh yeah, you're like supposedly a clever person. You like gone to university, got this degree and stuff, but you're spending all your time doing this, which like doesn't make any money. And at the time I was like kind of in agreement with her. And I kind of was like, all right, I'll, I'll quit poker. I'll go into the real world and um, try and get like a proper job and make a contribution. Um, and I was like a consultant in this job. And what I basically concluded after a year of doing this, where like it's, it's so much about like, I was in a job where we supposedly made a difference, you know, we were like helping government services, but so yeah. much of it is like you end up playing a different game where you're just trying to make money for your company. And it doesn't necessarily help like the, the people in the end anyway. It's and like, yeah, like, you see the company is thriving and succeeding. You're sitting there like, okay, what about me? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and also I'm not even conv- that convinced what I did like helped like even the, the company services. I'm not sure it even helped the client sometimes. Yeah. And I think like it's, it's like on a macro scale, it's really hard to say like that certain job, there's, there's very few jobs which are obviously good. Like sure, if you're a fireman or a doctor, you can probably say, maybe not in the US if you're a doctor, but if you're a doctor in the UK, um, <laughs> Don't give me you, can, you can probably say like, what you're doing is definitely good. And um, 
but like the, the world's so complicated that I kind of my, my, I kind of ended up like obviously I came back to poker but it's kind of like obviously it's very hard to do like something which is like purely good but you can have like on the small interactions you have on a micro scale you can make sure you like make people's lives better and help people like around you and I kind yeah. of think that's the most important thing because you can actually really control that rather than just be um like trying to pursue some massive macro goal and like not really sure if it's having the effect you're intended in the first place yeah exactly I was going to say something along the same lines, to be fair. Like, I find it really interesting that people definitely have this like moral question. Do they like to sometimes, or some people, whatever, that they're just like, oh, like, you know, is this like something good you're doing? But then let's say I'm a banker or something. People are never really going to question the morality of that job, I would argue. But at the same time, there is, you know, like George is saying, like it's very, very difficult outside of, you know, healthcare. I guess maybe uh, teaching stuff like this like are you actually you know contributing to society and like yeah being able to make an actual difference in like the lives of people you care about or even just like people you meet on a daily basis is probably you know like the best you can hope to do I think outside of it's it's, it's got to be subjective at the end of the day and I think like if anyone came up to me and he was like yeah mate I'm a poker player. I'm doing more good in the world than like a, a UNICEF volunteer. I would, obviously, it's not true. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think like it's a much more nuanced argument than being like, uh, like some jobs good, some jobs bad. And I think like, yeah, if unless you like really try extremely hard and make extreme sacrifices yourself, it's hard to do something which is like purely good for the world. Um, yeah. So I think like, yeah, I, I kind of respect everyone has to make their own choices. And I think the most important thing is that like when you can choose to do something which will like, make people happier or like so on you 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 choose the right thing if that makes sense yeah and i wonder too like just being like the stigmas around like gambling and poker kind of doesn't help our cause because i'm not sure how many times you guys have been asked so do you count cards it's like not even the same game like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> totally different it's like so like people's like don't quite understand what we do and yeah and yeah. I, it's like but that's probably doesn't help either yeah and poker well, obviously is quite is quite a predatory game like at the end of the day but but like it's just a game that like has to exist unless you take away freedoms of people to choose like the only way to stop poker is being like our oh, people aren't allowed to gamble so like which i think is a more negative thing but yeah 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 through going down that avenue as well like if you start cutting off people's like ability to gamble safely they just continue to gamble in less safe ways right like yeah going oh, down com. back street bookies or whatever it might be instead it's just yeah not, not it's like the old saying you know if someone wants to do it they're gonna find a way so you yeah, might yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> like that's yeah. like it's kind of like with like you know gambling it's becoming legalized across the states now and like marijuana too is another thing it's like you know people are gonna figure out a way to do it you might as well legalize it and make money off it <laughs> so. yeah uh, and i yeah i mean i guess we've opened our mind but let's well maybe yeah, we'll get back, <laughs> yeah. like, back on topic here I think we got a lot of questions, uh, a lot of questions later on as well about um, uh, Bitly and stuff in general. Like, there's a lot of guys who hate. I've got some funny ones actually. Some guys do not like CFPs. Um, yeah. On the internet. But um, that two plus Bobby. two thread with uh, yeah. like doo doo poker. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. But yeah, if we keep, if we keep kind of going for keep going for your, your um your journey, Dom. So you um. You joined Bit B. I've actually got a quote in in the one piece of research I did before the session. I got a quote from your blog in your first post where you said, um, "My first six months of professional were not pretty, to say the least. I was essentially break even to slightly losing before rate right back on ACR 15L blitz, and I was barely making any money. I finally hit a breaking point in early December, um, <laughs> and then um, yeah, from there you kind of joined Bit B, and and I, I, I mean like yeah, mostly Bit B was kind of plainish sailing for you i guess like um you you didn't have like i think i think you, you had like a lot of you ran a lot under ev at the beginning right yeah well, i had that one month i think yeah i was like 40 something buy-ins under ev the funny thing yeah. is i had no idea because i wasn't checking like i didn't look at a graph or anything for the entire month so it was kind of like a saving grace i didn't but yeah i was not i think i even bitched about it in my uh blog and then Jakob yeah. was quickly there to like <laughs> You know, remind me that it, you know it's not something I should be complaining about, but yeah, no. <laughs> Those first I, also, months were... I also saw when I was doing my research, sorry, that you had a one month where you lost thirty buy-ins, you won thirty buy-ins, and then you lost thirty buy-ins in six K hands, and actually, like, it kind of brought up to me because, like, yeah, you guys have probably seen Dom's graphs on Twitter, and like, when you look at the seven hundred K hands, it looks like it's straight up, but like, anyone who's lost thirty buy-ins in in like seven K hands will know that, like, when you're actually going through this, it does not feel like 
<laughs> your graph's going straight up, right? No. No, that's why it's funny. Like you see these graph, like yeah, you see that graph. And it's like there's still plenty of times where it's like, yeah, I was, you know, had days where I, or stretches where I just couldn't win or felt like I couldn't win. So I mean, even like even then, it's like funny to think about like, oh yeah, your life must have been so easy, just winning every day. It's like it's not the case. No, not at all. Like <laughs> even yeah. now, it's still not like that. And then how how did you um, how did you feel like? Because well, I'll just say as a preface, like lots of people and students might be or coaches, myself included, a temporary like can have like semi meltdowns, you know, when you have this like variance that you have to have, uh, it's, it's so easy to like, be like, oh, I'll take some time off poker, I'll play a lot of stakes, I'll change my approach. But like, yeah, like obviously you put in so much volume. Um, so yeah, how did you kind of like, just keep on keeping on in these periods? I think I just tried to remind myself a lot of like, you know, the first kind of lessons we learned in bit B about just consistency and putting the time in. And I think um, I, it's funny we talk about the 30 buying down swing. we, you know, with, with what, you know, Patrick kind of had a rough path, patch last year too. I think around that same time, actually. And I think reading that blog was. Yeah. Kind I think of, so. you know, like kind of, I remember reading those posts and thinking, okay, like he's, you know, he's going through it too. And he's still showing up every day, even though it sounds like he doesn't really want to. And um, it's just more reminding yourself like, okay, as long as I put the right, the work in and do the right things and play well, it, it's got to come back eventually. Um, and so. Um, I think like I try, that's probably why I try not to look at my results too often because like, I just would rather not know because if things are going really well, you don't want to screw it up. But if things are going really bad, you're just, you know, it's good to be like, oh, well, I need to start winning. So I'm just going to make, start doing things that aren't maybe optimal so that I win, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, it's just maybe just try not to focus on the results and just try to make sure that what I'm doing is profitable in the long term. I think, I think the way you guys present the information, the way like, the, the coaches in general, just the, how you guys go about things really helped me in that regard. Um, and I think too, if we remember when Daryl had like, he had those back-to-back -back days where they give out a hundred K score and a 900 K score. Yeah. It's like a year or, two, like, or yeah, so yeah. ago. It's just uh, standard Daryl, like winning a lot of money. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I, I don't remember in my blog when I mentioned how like it was really impressive to me, how he had the, the 900 K score. And then the next day he was hosting, he was doing group coaching. And I was just like, wait a minute, like, bro, you just won a million dollars in two days. Like, what are you doing? Like, well, go, go party. Like, <laughs> go do something. Yeah, like, yeah, know? yeah. But though, I like yeah. stuff because like, all right, this guy just won a lot of money. He's still back in there trying to get better. It's like, you know, maybe there's a reason why he's one of the best players in the world. And maybe yeah. I should do that myself instead of, you know, not doing that. So. so something you said actually speaks to me a bit in terms of like dealing with downswings. I think there's something massive about just like the community aspect of being in some kind of like CFP yeah. or even if it's just some kind of like study group where you're, you're with a bunch of guys going through the same thing that you're going through like seeing other people struggle show up get it done or even like people that you're studying with on a day-to-day -day basis like you know you're on like a similar level to them and they're crushing it it's like hey look we're just going through a down downswing we're going to get out the other side of this like, yeah we just got to you put put one foot in front of the other and yeah, exactly. uh, it's going to come good in the end. I think this is like massive rather than but, like going the course on your own. Yeah. And I think you mentioned like the community aspect too. It was, I think what we have 20 some people, at least in Bitby right now and including coaches. And so, I mean, at, at, with a group that level, like somebody's going to be going through it, you know, at, at any given point. Yeah. And so it is kind of comforting if you, you know, if you are going through it yourself and to be fair, I didn't really go through it too much. So I, I, really can't complain too much but just at least you're knowing like okay like at least i have a group here and you know that you know very high level players that if, if if i'm going if i'm doing something wrong they'll tell me and that's the great thing too is i think you guys are always up front you're very like positive and supporting or supportive but you're also very upfront too so like you give the critiques you need but you don't like actually like you know mash someone into little pieces and make them feel like shit you know yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the community aspect was huge as, you know, piece I mentioned because of the things I mentioned. Yeah. I think, I think it's like interesting because I also, um, have been like going for a, ma a massive downturn this year. And I think like what Patrick says, well, where like you kind of study with people every day and like, you know, you're not the same as like the other coaches, you know, like I know I played differently to Daryl, Patrick and, and Jacob, um, and Ignas, but, um, I also know that our style is like very, very similar and the way you think about the game is the same. So you yeah. do get the kind of like support of the net results and the same for like Bitby itself. Like you see that like the group still makes money every month and your results are kind of a subset of the group. So like, yeah. I think it really does help to like, you believe in the process and like a lot of CFPs, I think, well, it's kind of the, the variety, I guess, like there's the, 
the detox guys who all play exactly the same because they follow like a kind of like hive mind like protocol approach then there's like yeah. other cfps that like have different coaches who play like completely different styles and we're somewhere in the middle but like we are all following like the same ideas about poker right um yeah. and um yeah i think it definitely helps with um results yeah and yeah and then on the daryl approach as well this is one thing that like when you're saying about daryl he had his massive score and he's back to studying and this yeah. is one thing that like he is unbelievably good at i think especially compared to to me and the others in our crew it's just he's like so so level-headed around like um results and, and swings and stuff like this and like so so good at um just like yeah trusting the process and not really caring too much about how things go on a day-to-day -day basis yeah and like i said that was that that, that left an impression on me and just how I should approach things because, you know, whether it's good or bad, the work needs to be put in regardless. Yeah, for sure. So. And I think like also it's like one of the things I respect the most um, about like other players, not even in the group outside, it's just the people that have shown up for years and years and years because like these guys, they're not the survivors, you know, they're the guys who like, it was always going to go well for them because they kept showing up at high stakes and they kept playing well. And it's like not an easy thing to do because you will no. go through some like serious shit at some point. And, yeah, um, I mean, it, like, a lot of people get upset. Oh, this, you know, guy limp called a 7 4 offsuit and then flopped two pair against my aces, and this is stupid. And I'm out of 20 million down. So it's like, well, would you rather he not do that? Like, yeah, that's kind of how I do. It's like, I feel like if, he, if I lose, it's like, all right, well, it's going to come back eventually, you know, if he's yeah. doing that. But it's like, you know, you see people that just like flame out and go nuts because of that. It's like, well, yeah, uh, would you rather put a, you know, pile solver bot in that seat instead? Like, what do you want? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's for regs too, yeah. Yeah. And like, like I always say, like, I think it's the most like career, it's obviously easy to forget, but the thing that defines how well you do in your career is how well you do in like the stretches where you run horribly because like everyone does kind of find when they're running well. Um, so yeah. yeah, just like keeping on showing up is worth so much and such a skill. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, there was something else I was going to like uh, comment on there, but I've lost my train of thought now. Um, so yeah, like when I think one, I think we may as well talk about one of the questions we had now, which was like, um, what is the difference between like the 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 in your experience between like the regulated pools and the um, the kind of ACR blitz pools that you were playing beforehand? Um, so because, oh God. I was just gonna sorry, I was just gonna tell you like this. There's a funny anecdote where like you were. I had to remember this happening where you were saying you weren't getting enough volume on your on Michigan, and you were like, oh, yeah, I am gonna go play. Um, I think it was like 500 no blitz or 200 no blitz. And yeah, I was like, I, I, I never played these games, obviously, but I just had the impression that ACR blitz games would be like tough or whatever. And I was like, yo, be careful, man. Like these are, these are tough games, like Zoom, everyone's knitted. And then like you were, I, I remember your response being a bit like, what, what the fuck, man, I've been crushing. And then like, I, I was like, yeah, fine, go ahead. But then I think you actually did crush you, you, when you were playing there as well. You were like, yeah, just. Um, just kind of like, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I didn't crush. I only played like 5,000 hands. I think I lost a little bit. I mean, it wasn't like anything too crazy, nothing to yeah, I don't right. think I ran very well, but regardless, I mean, I think yeah, it was kind of dead. It was around this time last year, and I was like, I was playing more volume, and then I realized like, why am I playing two hundred and all fast fold when I mean I could just play two hundred all on the Michigan sites? And um, I mean, yeah, obviously it's tougher field. I mean, I think if I played two hundred blitz, I would be an easy winner. Um, I'm, yeah, I agree. People sure. are probably be like, oh, why don't you go do it? It's like it's not worth my time. But <laughs> to be being honest, but um, I uh, I mean I, I think from what I I haven't played ignition in a, since I the Michigan sites opened up. From everything I've been told, it's almost the same. Basically, 500 and 1K is like basically the same thing um, in terms of like skill level. Yeah. Um, so it's like I mean, from base, I've had a few friends that have played both stakes. Like, yeah, there's like very little difference. Um, so it's not like Michigan is just like super incredibly soft. It's just all whales. I mean, there's some guys who play for a living who play decently well, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but obviously, I mean, I think the thing is like on ACR, there's just more higher record or um, concentration of rags Russians. and like then oh well, yeah that too but <laughs> no just more i mean more like nitty grinders compared to like michigan where there's more fun players yeah um would be the main thing but i mean yeah. are, the, are those russian grinder 200 up blitz guys un unbeatable no i mean i used to think they were but no i could i would say they're not but it's just you have to they're, they're obviously tougher to beat because they're not i, I would say I, on the other hand. I, I would like i would confidently say that i would like stake you to uh, obviously i think like us coaches were a better place anyway to talk about like the different pools but i mean I, I would stake you for like 1k on european sites which like very very happily like yeah um and like yeah i think there's like obviously your win rate is higher on these sites because the rec race rec to reg ratio is maybe better but like um i also 
think like I've seen obviously I know how obviously all the other pools play and I've seen your seen your stats and I've seen the stats of your opponents and like there are still like competent regs playing obviously and um yeah I think that like yeah especially from what I've seen on ignition uh, from other students I think it's like um very very similar kind of kind of game honestly yeah yeah I mean like I said I've had multiple people that have played both ignition like 1k and Michigan 1k and they're like yeah there's like very little difference like <laughs> ignition might be slightly harder but it's not like anything to write home about yeah so. and, and then like also I said like, obviously playing 200 L blitz is suboptimal decision for pretty much any person any single reg in the world because obviously low win rate um just like if you have the ability to beat that game you can play much higher in, in softer yeah. games so yeah exactly yeah. I mean like I said it was my I was well I was well rolled to even play one game at that point so like why would I sit there and play 200 L blitz when I think the games in Michigan picked up a bit more too around that time. So it's like, okay, I, I, I found myself not needing to fill tables anyways. Yeah. So basically, the reason I did it was when I was like dead and wanted, when it was dead and I wanted to play. So like if I had like one or two Michigan tables, I'd pull like two blitz tables up and then just kind of basically to occupy myself, which was yeah, no sense. reason to do that really. So, <laughs> but lesson learned, as they say. Yeah, the Zoom pools nowadays seem even more dead than they used to be. So like, I don't know, the ceiling is even lower than it ever was, you know? Like, I remember when I was kind of coming up, everyone would be like 500 Zooms, like the pinnacle of online poker, right, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I used to think that too, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you kind of get there and it's like, well, actually, like, yeah, these guys are solid. They're not like the best in the world by any, by any means. And also, like, why am I playing this game when I can play, yeah. you know, the regular tables at the same stakes or even, you know, like 10 or 20 times higher if I want yeah, to. Yeah. You know? It's like, yeah. yeah. There's no yeah, I mean, point. without getting too much into like you know what help me form this opinion but like when i joined the group and just kind of saw like saw you guys and you know your thoughts on 500 zoom it's like wow okay maybe it's not like everything it's cracked up to be i mean yeah there's good players that play it but it's like it, it's not 10k you know on stars it's like it's yeah. nowhere near that <laughs> like you know, not many of those regs would actually be beating that stake you know it's, it's actually a crazy thing that happened though and i actually don't really understand how it happened um if you have where it is, but these like 500 Zoom heroes, they became like the kind of like most famous guys in online poker. I think just because it was the highest stakes, the highest stakes that run. But like, even I would even say that like, even myself, when I like got back into poker before I like moved in with Marcus and stuff, I thought that like these guys, I was like, yeah, mate, they're just playing Zoom because the hands per hour. And I thought they were like the top, the top guys. Yeah. And then obviously, like, Marcus taught me how poker actually works. And I was like, ah, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah but it's like a it's still in the like the public ethos i guess that like yeah the guy he's streaming 500 zoom he's the best in the world mate um well yeah. i see that's funny like with like you know obviously and i don't know you know you guys know i don't know the viewers know but like david k poker is one of, is my best friend in real life and you know knowing for him it's like if he played 500 zoom it'd be great for a stream because you know you just type in five you know you put that tag 500 zoom and everyone's like oh my god i want to watch this it's like it's it's more like the public perception of it. And like people think it's like so cool because it's the highest Zoom stakes that run. So it's like anybody who plays that's like a god. I mean, like what's the you know Easty? I think his name is. Or yeah, I, I, I've actually seen some of this guy's stream. Yeah, like he had his buddy famous. play five hundred Zoom. And it was like one of his biggest streams ever. He's famous in this house. This guy. Yeah, he's got the. He's for anyone watching and shout out Easty if you're um, if you're here. Um, my housemate loves. He had some kind of bankroll challenge to go from like ten and out to. What, 1k or something and like yeah my, my house might used to love watching these streams anyway um but yeah he's a, he's a, he's, watch some of his youtube highlights as well he's an, like, an english he's an english lad yeah he um <laughs> he, yeah i actually i really enjoy streams but i'll give you one tip if you're watching these days like pocket pocket queens pre-flop you're good to go it's <laughs> <laughs> what i'd say it's funny him and uh, david were messaging him at the world series and apparently like I think I, he was actually pretty close to me. Like I didn't actually talk to him anymore. I think I looked over and like saw him a few tables over on the day three of the main, and he was like really short. And apparently, he told David he wasn't even looking at his cards on the money bubble because he just wanted to cash. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny a lot of people were doing that, but I respect it. <laughs> yeah, I, the um, I, yeah, I respect it. I mean, obviously there is ICM quite big. I remember like another another guy in um, a guy in our house had a similar spot. But I think it was in a tournament. It was like um, it was a it was Cameron actually. I'm pretty sure Ishta. And yeah. it was a, ten, a satellite to the main event, right? Um, and it was, like, the point where Cameron was, like, guaranteed to, to cash, right, basically. <laughs> and, like, everyone at the table was, like, on the beers. There was, like, one person left to bust. Um, and, like, they were all, like, oh, yeah, that's, like, it was kind of table agreement to not bust anyone from this table. So they all made the main event. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
like it wasn't like a vocal agreement but everyone was just like falling into the big fun the big fun would be like fist pumping everyone else and stuff like this or, or something like hyped up and then it was like super late at night and Cameron said he just got like he was like super covered the guy in a small blind or something um and he like I'll, I'll put to the story but he called him with some like questionable asex where like he would still be left with a massive stack but the guy the guy could bust and then everyone at the table like hated him like absolutely hated him because they he like crushed his gut and he was like sorry guys i just wanted to go to bed i was just saying like so they'd be happy because he got like now he's getting them he's getting them out of like yeah you know, they busted, they bust, he, he busted their boy yeah but yeah <laughs> that's funny yeah um but yeah i can imagine spike calling him lives not so good yeah no um all right what have i got in my uh, in my notepad file um um, that I spent two minutes making before the call. Was I say with all the research you did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the work you put in before this. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say I've got a I've got a thing here which says Bit B question mark, which I guess means uh, I want to talk. Want to do a bit of prom, promo for Bit B. Um, but yeah, I mean, like um, do your plugging, do your shilling, whatever you need to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, is, was there any like any like aha moments you had when you were kind of like at Bit B without sharing too much? advanced strategy very hard question to answer i mean i don't know there's like a, i can't say there's like one thing that it just clicked for me but i think and it's funny i think maybe some people might have taken this as a slight but if you remember when ignas became a coach and you offered me like i could have two less or basically three sessions with him in the span of like two months yeah i remember this year. and i snapped i was like yeah sure like i mean i because i already had one of them and it was really good and it's like I think some people would have been like, well, you're going to give me the new guy? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, that's ridiculous. But in my mind, I was like, well, he's very good. I'm going to get three sessions instead of two. So it's like, you know, more value for me. And so it was like a no brainer. And I think after those few sessions, I remember like I started playing, like, I think my results kind of took off from there. Um, And so a lot of what we went over, I'm not going to get into what we went over, but um, a lot of like those sessions that we we went over really just kind of started clicking in my, in my thought process in game. I think like that was, and that was kind of aha moment. It was probably right, right around this time this year. It was like kind of late July, early August. Um, but yeah, it's just funny. Like I said, I think something that might have been you know offensive or a slight to others because again, the new guy. Why you know why am I? Why can't I get? Why can't I be with George or Patrick? Why am I getting the new guy? Yeah. But I think I think like I, if I would say anything to others about that. It's like you know what? Just maybe you have to look at something or things from a different perspective, other than you know just oh they're trying to screw me or whatever. Maybe like you know try to find the good in it. Uh, yeah like i did yeah, that situation so just, just for context for people watching ignas is uh he was a bit b student who was playing 25 now as well when he joined and then he's playing like 1k 2k now um and he was like um he, he's like a very very strong poker player but we got him to do some we, he's now like a bit b coach uh because he uh, yeah plays the exact same way as all the coaches and, and like very very good coach as well i think um, yeah. And yeah, I think as well, it's, it's almost easier to coach. So we, we offered Dom when, when Ignace was first time, we said, Dom, you can have like extra coaching sessions a month, but you kind of like get Ignace's first, first like active student. Um, and yeah, like it's sometimes easier to learn from someone who learned stuff more recently as well, I think possibly. Um, cause he'd like obviously just grows up the stakes and yeah, you, you studied a lot with Ignace as well, right, Patrick? He's very unknown outside yeah. of Bitby, I guess. Yeah. yeah. He's super under the radar guy, you know, like if even if you mentioned his screen names which i won't like i i, I mean the people would have played with him but they wouldn't be like like recognizable like oh spiel or like you know one of these like super high stakes and bosses who everyone kind of instantly recognizes but yeah um the thing is as well like with the whole bit of the ethos of like keep the group small and the coaching high quality we're obviously not just gonna like throw some random guy at our like prospective um like students or actual students i should say that you know it isn't gonna offer at least a comparable quality of coaching that like we would be able to do right like it's just yeah this is no good for us like at the same at the end of the day like we're our incentives are aligned alongside yours right so yeah yeah i was i was just gonna say too i mean um i'm not gonna name the other cfp it's a current bb student who came from a different cfp and i remember him mentioning like you know there's a big high stakes name who's associated with this cfp and but his like coach that we like directly talked to you know when he had a question played like 500 and now on ignition and this guy's playing 200 on the mission sites and it's like for me i was playing i was playing 200 on the mission sites if i had a question i got an answer from from either one of you two from daryl from marcus from donald from ignace i mean it's like i'm getting an answer from 
you know, the headliners of the group, that's who's answering my questions, not some guy who's playing 500 and all on the ignition. Not that that's like, you know, they could be a good player, but they're, yeah. they're not a high stakes, you know. Yeah. And, and I was like, 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 they're just not. Yeah. Like, so. And like, this comes, comes back to the 500 zoom thing a bit. It's like the difference between, um, like before, before I like kind of started playing high stakes and, um, like I, I didn't know there was such a big difference, you know what I mean? And the difference between someone like Marcus and Daryl and then like a, a like 1K reg, it's just it's just as, and like a 1K bum hunter, for example, the difference is just like it's they're not playing the same game. It's like actually not unfair to say that. And and like when you're learning, if if it's someone who doesn't really understand but kind of takes the right action a lot of the time, sure, like they might have okay results, but you can't learn much from this guy. And like this is what you're you're looking for most of the time when you're trying to get to high stakes, at least you want to understand why things happen so that you can like change your game plan to to win more money at the tables yeah um, yeah but i think there's a misconception where people don't really don't understand how big the gap is um and like we, me and patrick are kind of privileged that we had the opportunity to like learn so much from these guys yeah um yeah but yeah like do you mind if i ask like how did how did you meet them if you don't mind sharing i'm like that's like i've always wanted yeah, yeah sure yeah this is actually another thing i want to, i want to talk about this as well like the difference between study groups and like cfps and stuff but yeah, I was um, in a um, study group like right at the beginning of my career with, let's give us a shout out. It was, it was Daryl in there. It was Big Mick, if he's ever watching. Um, he, he plays tournaments now. I this think. isn't the one that you left with uh, Linus. You thought oh yeah, Linus, crazy, right? Linus was in there for a while. <laughs> mate, Linus, he was bad, mate. I'm telling you now, he was a bad player. Um, yeah, he was just too aggressive. Imagine where you'd be now if you stayed in that group. <laughs> <laughs> I think... It was a good a bit of time. I was in a group with Linus, Big Blind Bets, and Limitless, I think. And I was like, fuck these guys, mate. They're so bad. Um, <laughs> they're, they're like, and this is when I was like 19. I think I rage quit the group. Um, but yeah, anyway, I like met I met Darryl, Thank you for quitting um, that group for my own personal sake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, was, I was in a group with like Daryl, uh, Jason, and Aguayan, um, what's his name? And then, and then anyway, what happened was there was like, this is when two plus two was big. It was, and um, I, would, I ended up in like a CFP with zero one one zero one, who's like a high six PLO right now. It was me and Donald in his CFP, um, and Daryl was in Ryan's CFP, um, Shark Beto for the two plus two original guys. And so there was like these two CFPs going on basically, and the two guys running them were good friends, and it wasn't like Bit B honestly, but um, yeah, and like then just kind of met them in real life. Met Marcus like Marcus somehow got involved in this crew in Barcelona once, and then. Yeah, I think I met Marcus for one week and then we moved into a house together in Vienna, so it was a bit rogue, but yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you got to take risks in life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Patrick was um, in my CFP with Pat- yeah. Ish- 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 Ishter and Patrick. No, wait, it was Ishter and um, Roberto first, Shao Roberto, yeah, yeah. for my two students. And then Patrick was after after Ishter. Um, yeah. Yeah, in my CFP. Yeah. yeah, we met at uni and you... I played, I think, I, see, I actually remember like wh- how how I got recruited. I was just like randomly talking to you on Facebook one one day and I was like, oh yeah, yeah I played like 70,000 hands of 25 and I was doing this, this week. And you were just like, the fuck? And then you're like, oh, may, may, maybe maybe this high volume guy can take him under my wing. And then yeah. we had a little, little Skype conversation and then that was it. <laughs> yeah. And the, these these old CFPs, mate, they were so stupid. Like, well, they were good, obviously. <laughs> Like the, the, the ones when I was like running them, um, when it wasn't bit B and it was like two students and me coaching them when I was playing Tona and Zoom. And like, I think I was like state. So I, I like staked all my students and some of my students were playing 100 Zoom. And then at the same time, I was staked by Donald to play 400 NL. So it was like, it, it was just completely <laughs> insane. But yeah. Um, Sounds like a clusterfuck. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually, Sounds like a Ponzi actually. I was just saying, like to me, like as an American with all the taxes that you have to pay, like sounds like a fucking nightmare trying to figure all that out. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then actually, like it, this is something I was going to bring on to, like study groups versus CFPs. I think like I was in a lot of study groups as well before I was in like Ted's CFP. Yeah. Um, and then before I was in Bit B as well. Like, I think Bit B when it was like built in in like recent years was also kind of a CFP for me as well. When when I was like playing two hundred and all the students were playing fifty like back in the day because I was just every single day like study calls like streaming like studying with Patrick or Daryl and um yeah like it's just the differences in structure I think like everyone's like there to to like like obviously you, you have access to people who are so significantly better than you and everyone's like being kind of filtered to be there as well if that makes sense yeah um yeah yeah and I think like 
a lot of questions I have are like people that have been sent to me about CFPs, which again, we'll get to in a second. But um, every single person I know has been in a CFP, I think, at exception of Frank, who's upstairs. And like all of us like gave paid, paid a lot for that year. But then like, obviously it was like unbelievably worthwhile because the fast track you get in like learning is just, it's just insane because people think that you learn poker by looking at pie or something like this, but you, you don't really, right? Like yeah. that's not how you... <laughs> great good strategies and like you can just get so much like um acceleration and like your game plan from someone who has already done the work or been taught by other people oh totally yeah i mean it's like funny you mentioned the cfp thing it's like it's you know as you mentioned you pay a lot the first year and i definitely paid a lot but i think the thing i've like would i take from it's like yeah it cost me money but like now going forward i have a very good sense of how to create a, you know how i want to think about the game how i want to create my strategies and um i had i not done it yet would i have made money yeah i don't think i would have made as much even after talking about the coaching split um but then i'd also kind of still be lost like in terms of what i like look at pile outputs or whatever you want to call them and um i mean i would probably still just be clicking buttons and not really having a rhyme or reason to what i'm doing yeah. It's also, also too, when I like playing against other players and I start seeing some of the things they're doing. Exactly. It, yeah, it, it helps me pick out like, okay, like this is where they're making mistakes. This is where they're screwing up. And I can, like, I, I like, think that's been the big thing too, is just help, you know, you guys helping my understanding of theory. And then that could also help me pick out when people are, you know, not strong or making mistakes. And I think that's maybe a lot of money too, I would say. Especially in heads up, I think. Cause like, yeah, when you start playing this one, sorry, Patrick, what were you going to say? I don't think I was going to say anything. Okay, good. I was looking at you. I thought you were in there. Yeah, the other thing I was going to mention as well quickly is like, um, well, a couple of things. Again, we're kind of continuing the sales pitch here, but I think it's necessary to be said with the amount. I got so many, I've actually got a few questions being like, yeah, like how can you justify CFPs and stuff? And I think like, um, there's two things I'd say is like, number one, like we have learned at BitB for sure that like taking on people who aren't going to be happy is, is just my CV for us, you know? Like yeah, all of us as coaches kind of have enough money that we don't need to be grinding. Like we don't need to be like putting people into, into slavery to like make as much from them as we can. And if, if someone real, like anyone who's playing mid six plus is a smart person. And if they realize that they're like being like fucked by like the organization, like they're obviously not going to be happy and it creates a to toxic atmosphere. And like it be for all of us is like an extension of our study. It's like, we, we study and we share it with the group or we stream our study session and share it with the group. Like these are the guys we speak to every single day. And like, if someone's not going to be happy with the deal, then um, it's just a horrible, it's just not a fun environment to be involved in. So like, yeah, like firstly, I've said actively, we've actively turned down like quite a few people who we think that's the case for, um, even when they like push to, to join. Um, and then secondly, the like, all of me, me Daryl and Marcus found this as well outside of our CFPs, like, the network effects you get in like the years afterwards are worth so, so much because like suddenly you've got like this group of people with like infinite capital who are like are confident in your game plan and are going to tell you or invest in you as well because they can take pieces of you at higher stakes, going to tell you where the good games are, are going to like keep keep on letting you improve. Like I don't think anyone's left BitB for like a, at least a year now. Like when people finish their contracts, they choose to stay always. Um, yeah. And yeah, like through through mine, I like met so many people and like so many of these guys like took action in me in high stakes and uh, like told me what told me better games to play and like got me hooked up with like different deals with like different sites and stuff like this. Um, yeah, it's like if you don't know about this stuff, you don't realize how much it's worth, but it's really worth infinite and for peace of mind as well because you know you'll never basically have to worry about like being stake rolled for a stake ever again in your life. No, and, and you're not alone. I mean, the thing too is like you, like I, like I mentioned before, it's like if I had a question, I could go to someone who I know has been there, done that, you know, at some of the, in some of the biggest games in the world. And like, it's kind of the same thing. Like you, you have a community of very strong people, like very smart people, very good players. And so, you know, if not, not if you're not in a CFP and you know, you're by yourself, you know, it's totally different. You're on your own. And if, you know, things aren't going well, who do you go to? You know, and, <laughs> you and, and you're not poker friends, they don't get it. Yeah, and you're against these guys as well at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? Like I yeah. always feel like, yeah, like you, you've got the guys who like speak hands of the with their coaches, like ask you of like how how would you play against this guy when he's like doing this or whatever, and they get to ask like the best person in the world. Um, mm -hmm. it's tough to compete with that. And yeah. then the um um yeah, I think like the other thing I was gonna mention as well is um that like it that people 
people also always say like to the, the, the coaches are free rolling for example actually i think i delete uh, i accidentally blocked the guy on twitter who posted this thing um bobby but he posted this <laughs> unbelievable comment and I, I i blocked him now and the comment disappears so i can't see it but i think it was something along the lines of like uh um how that it was like cfp is cfp is enslavement and a free roll for the coaches this is what he said. So I was going to ask you, yeah, Dom, your year, your year of enslavement, mate. How did you, how did you make it out alive? I, yeah, no, it was tough. Uh, no, I guess now that he's bringing it up, might as well, you know, air out all the dirty laundry. No, uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's just like shit. I mean, I, 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 you mentioned like the free roll. It's like, well, you're investing time and energy. I and mean, I know you've had students where you didn't make a single dime and you, know, you still put in plenty of time and you know, you had to, prepare for one-on-ones and answer their questions. And it's not like that's not worth nothing. Right. I mean, yeah. You guys, I mean, if you were, if you're on the open market, you could charge a very good rate for your one-on-one coaching. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like if, if, if it was like Daryl or Marcus one-on-one coach, you know, it's like way, way over like thousand dollars an hour, you know? Like, oh yeah. It's like five, five maybe Marcus like $5,000 an hour. And it's just like, it's just so stupid to say it's a free roll of, uh, when, when you take that into account. Yeah. Um, I think as well, there's like no better incentive structure for like both people involved, right? Like with hourly coaching, like ignoring like the fact that I would argue the best coaches aren't offering for hourly coaching to begin with, like on the open market, at least. Um, Like there's no better incentive structure. Like we don't win if you don't win, right? Like it's not a free roll for us at all. Like it is like time is money at the end of the day, especially in, in an industry where like the opportunity cost is literally like could be grinding instead of coaching you right yeah, now. Yeah, where your hourly is like reasonably yeah. comfortable to say anyone, any one of the coaches out is like $400 plus from playing. So like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's just kind of nonsensical in, yeah. at least yeah. I would say. And yeah, like the alignment, like we win when you win, we want you to do well with hourly coaching. Like how do you actually have any idea what the, that guy is coaching you is really a like top class and b like everything that he knows you know yeah, like yeah. we have incentive to give you the best information so that you can make the most money with it on the table and then we, we make the most money of it like in turn right yeah i mean and, like if you don't give me that information you don't make as much money or you don't make money so exactly yeah, yeah, right, exactly yeah. that's kind of why i was really interested in, like a cfp model in the first place i mean and i know if you've i had talked to few friends and they were like well you know why would you give them your profit why can't you just find an hourly coach and it's like well there are no I good could, but like mate. i mean like especially with this group it's like these are like you look at the biggest games in the world these guys are in these games it's like yeah i mean i'll be honest like when i first joined a lot of it was because like i knew who marcus was i was like oh he's like you know play he's a pen boss he plays all the biggest games like that's the guy you want to study with right yeah and then i mean knowing that you guys are all friends with them too but it's like you know it, yeah, the hourly coach, if he's beating 200 or 500, no, he could help you, sure. But, you know, how good is the information compared to what, you know, either one of you give me or what Daryl or Marcus or even when Donald was coaching Donald? Yeah. Honestly, I would yeah. say too, is Marcus and Donald, because I like would read Donald's like blogs back in the day. So I knew he was like a good, good player. <laughs> he did really well. And so. Yeah. Honestly, I had no idea either one of you two were <laughs> before I joined. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously, that's what I do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I will say this as well. Like, like when people when people ask me, like uh, often, like people say, like, oh, who do you recommend and stuff like this? And like, obviously, I've been kind of CFP uh, red pill because I think that B's gone so well for so many people, and like CFP went well for all my crew. But there are also some some bad CFPs out there. Obviously, like, don't if you are applying, don't look look, look for like the student to coach ratio and look for the coaches' incentives as well. Like, yeah, I think part of the reason BitB works so well is because the coaches are all trying to get better, play high stakes, and they treat it as like an extension of their study. They're not trying to like squeeze every last penny um, out of the coaches. And yeah, for hourly coaching, if like if you're a good player, like a kind of good 200 L player, it's tough for me to recommend anyone. If you think you're a good hourly coach, message me because I'll, I'll spam your name to people who, who send me. But I think like, I think Yuri Pella does hourly coaching. I think I really like the way he approaches the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so I normally, normally say that, but yeah. Yeah, um, just um, moving on anyway from the from the CFP um, spam. Get ready um, for the haters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, I've been through. I want to say, I wish I haven't blocked Bobby actually now. Um, <laughs> let's do some let's do some quick fire questions. We have um, 
can the podcast be found on Spotify? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Dom, do you do you tile or cascade? Um, oh, geez, Utaka. Um, I tile. <laughs> nice. Okay, I saw that. I mean, question, who, yeah. who the hell can cascade, mate? Like, I've never. Donald I've, used I, to do this, right? Donald I've used never to seen. Do- Oh no, he used to have to stack in one corner and then it would pop out when he made an action or something and then it yeah, would like, tile yeah. some like it was madness. Like free flop yeah. actions only, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've never heard of I haven't anyone. Zoom rank power range. Should we answer Tom's question that he just posted in the group? Is that in in, in group? Okay, yeah. It's in general, yeah. Wait, a hundred zoom rank power ranking. Five hundred. Ah, okay. Decent. He he's guessed the topic. Um, <laughs> all right. Um Let's go with, we'll go with one. I saw a good one on Twitter. I'm just trying to find it again. He said, is the jump to 5K um, and from there higher any different from the stakes moving up? So I think what this guy is saying is he's saying like, um, getting to 5K firstly, so we can talk about that first. I mean, you, you don't have 5K on American sites, right, Dom? Or, or you, it really do. runs. I've like started, if it has ran, I've started to sit it because yeah. uh, or play it. I've open set it a couple times, but um, I, I, it's still something that's kind of a new stake to me. I'm not going to just full on dive into it quite yet. Um, I would say the jump from, for me, two to 500 was, and, and I'll be honest, I, I'm in Michigan, so ring fence site, say what you want to say. Um, that was a definitely, a, you know, a, that was a jump for me, I think. That's for at least for my pool. In my opinion, when you get to 500, I was when you start, we'll start to play the, the stronger players. Um, I know me and a couple other guys, they're the one guy I really respect, won't really ever sit 200. Um, it's, it's just not worth our time anymore. Yeah. Um, but I would say that was the big jump. And then 1K and 2K, well, I mean, once I got to 500 and established, I think those two jumps were not too difficult. Um, I did run well at the beginning for both of them. Um, so that made it easy. But um, no, I, I mean, for me, I think 200 to 500 was the big, was the, really the one that was the toughest. Um, yeah. this also, to be fair, when I started playing 500 before I joined, I was right before I joined Dip B, so I wasn't quite as strong of a player. And so I think when I started playing 1K and 2K, I was already a few months into the coaching, and that definitely helped just being better. So, like, they, I didn't have as much trouble because of that. But, um, yeah, that, in my experience, that was kind of the 500, 200, 500 was the toughest jump. Yeah. I was going to ask, actually, is the player pool in Michigan, like, for 1K, 2K, 5K when it runs, is it very much the same regs anyway? Yeah. Because, yeah, this is... Like, this 1K, is, 2K, it's all a lot of the same guys, yeah. I mean, the- yeah, yeah, because this is something I found when moving up. I don't know if you're the same, G, but um, I, I thought the jump from 1K to 2K was kind of big because at least the way that I visualize stuff working on sites like Stars is like mid stakes i would say is up to like 1k and you like 501k is a lot of the same guys but then you get some of the high stakes guys who play 2k who would never ever touch 1k if you think about like dud sometimes plays it like ospiel sometimes plays it like davy yeah. jones like these kind of guys right so i thought like jump from 1 to 2k was kind of big 2 to 5k i would say it depends kind of on what site you're playing like whether or not it's like yeah i don't know if you found the same thing but i think yeah 5k on certain sites is a lot tougher than on other sites yeah Yeah, but the player pool at that point from like 5k plus is basically the same right yeah i think on on eu sites there's kind of like it's kind of changed over the years as well maybe inflation (laughs) but um like 200 to 500 is a big jump because you go from like kind of semi-professionals like full professionals yeah and then yeah yeah, 501 k is kind of the same guys and then like 2k plus is like where you start to face like the, the really really strong players who are like not copying pyro at all but they understand how like forming strategy works um yeah and then like there's i mean i guess the, the other thing weird thing that happens is when you get to like really really high stakes like 40k 100k you the games often get like a bit softer because at these stakes like it's about having the connections to like put like very few people are rolled for these stakes you know um, so quite often you get like a lot of tournament players playing them, a lot of like semi-retired people, Marcus, no, I'm joking. PLA and PLO regs. But but you get like um like kind of soft lines again, but then obviously it's it's hard because it's it is just like at least I've found it's it's hard and, and my results have been awful in these super high stage games. It's just hard to execute, like even if you know you're like better than these like tournament guys who randomly play, it is just very difficult to execute at like like 10 extra stakes, even if you've sold action. Um, so yeah, respect to the guys who like 
Losing $40,000 is a lot harder than losing 5000 right? Yeah, even if it's not your <laughs> money, even if yeah. it's someone else's money, yeah. Um, well, for me, it's almost harder because I'm not like, – I mean, I, to be fair, I never play back. It's just I don't like doing it for that for this reason. Um, like in the main event, I had 85% of myself, and I refused to sell anymore. I just didn't want to have to answer to like 10 people about why I didn't, you know, go far, why I didn't cash. Or it's like the same thing. It's like you, you dust off a stack at 40K, and you have to sit there and be like, yeah, well, why did you do that? It's like, yeah. I mean, especially because a lot of people are asking to buy, like, aren't really poker players. It's like, I'm not going to sit there and explain to them why I lost Queens versus Ace King pre flop. Like, yeah. why did you go all in? It's like, well, because I had a good hand. Like, when I didn't win. Like, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, selling, selling, selling to non-poker players i think is a, is a very bad idea yeah, yeah. i think yeah. like um i think like um yeah like my backers uh, honestly honestly like they they've just sent me infinite infinite money on my run in, in those places and not questioned once like um where it was possibly or any hands i made but um i actually i saw i didn't say this i had a piece of um uh linus in one of the triton events and i sold some of it to my now ex-girlfriend and this was an interesting one where she, where she we were oh, like, oh, like no. well, she had a bad feeling about him and um, like asking why he busted again. Um, so your yeah. non-poker playing girlfriend was questioning why this is about why he busted the tournament? Yeah, one more question. <laughs> questioning me for my um, decision. I think I, I think I even said, I was like, oh, yeah, I think this is his ROI. So I think this is the ROI of the investment. And then she was like, oh, this is rubbish. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> not, not well. well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I, I, um, I was going to say, yeah, and also I was going to say about the high stakes games, obviously these like super 40K games that run most on GG and I guess on the apps as well. But you do get the, the 40K specialists who are like, um, like Marcus and Linus who, who just don't play lower stakes, you know? And like, yeah. obviously like playing these guys is just awful. Like it's just re- relentless. Like and you, you know that like it's going to be very difficult for you to have like a, um, an EV edge uh, in like any single make your life hell. Yeah, and you, you yeah. just have to try. Yeah, it's very difficult for you to like do any of the things that you think generate UEV against them. And, um, yeah, is it interesting because like you live with Marcus, like when you're playing these games, I'm like, how does like I've always wondered that dynamic because like you know you have you and a couple other guys that live together. Yeah, we don't we don't play. Uh, me and Marcus never played at the same table. I think I, actually once once he accidentally sat the same lobby as me um, at five k, and um, he um, so it was like heads up, and we we were. This is, I, I used to grind like next to Marcus, which is why we never played the same table, obviously. Yeah. Um, but we were literally back to back, like like away from each other, playing heads up. Uh, five so if you really want to look, you can just do this. Yeah, and he, he, <laughs> he, like, he, I think he'd free bet, he'd free bet me, uh, C bet, and then just over bet jam the turn. And I had like unbelievable bluff catcher, like like completely the like. And you're sitting there like, God damn it, the kind of looks so bad. Bad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, I, I, I called and lost, and there was just that kind of awkward silence for a few seconds. But um, yeah, it's um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the dynamic is fine because obviously, like Marcus has way bigger pieces of himself in these games, so he has yeah. priority on seats, and um, yeah, it's um, easy enough to 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 get around. Um, but yeah, I think like like I said earlier in this, but the, the the in the show, um, the difference between like. A, a good high stakes reg, um, um, like say for example, someone like Ospiel, and then like a, a like winning one k reg is just like a completely different game they're playing. Um, mm. And I think like I underestimated that before in the past. Um, just reading some more questions. We have, um, no, it's about kind of relate related, I guess, but I'm not sure if we can really answer it. For the fans said, what leaks do you commonly see in mid-stakes NL that you don't see as often at fi- high-stakes NL, um, comparing 500 zoom to 2K plus? So, yeah, you can answer for your pool, Dom, or, or not answer, depending on how what you want to say. I'm going to go I, was just saying, I, I would say, I don't, I don't know. It, it, it's very, in my pool, it's very player-dependent because it's a small pool. Yeah. Um, I probably just keep that to myself, honestly. Yeah, it makes sense. I think it's, it's just like, I, I, again, like, I won't, wouldn't want to say specific things, but... Um, I think like people uh, like some people some people play some people have a strategy and some people are like not really thinking about their strategy and that's the biggest difference to between high stakes and, and low stakes I guess yeah and like yeah I mean I've been like extremely punished myself in this regard before where like you just when you're playing low stakes it's like very frequent at least for, for me and I guess you move on as well Patrick where you're like the best player at the table and like or like one of the, one of the stronger players at tables, no one's like actively um, taking EV away from you with their game plan. And once you start playing higher stakes, like like someone like, like someone like Stefan's at your table, like at least yeah. the oldest the oldest version of Stefan, he's just like you just 
just like get get so many like big blinds of EV extracted from your strategy just because he understands the game better than you, especially once he's played with you for a while. Um, yeah, for sure. I know for myself as well, like I was very slow moving up. Like I could have moved up a lot faster than I actually did, um, which is probably why when I tried to eventually move up, I did climb quite quickly. But like, yeah, there, there was a period where I could say like I was playing like two, I think George might have died. Oh no, he's back. Fine. Um, but yeah, I was playing like 200 and now, and um, I was winning post rake back. Uh, sorry, post rake in the like three handed battles that I was playing for like, I think I think in 2019 I played like 50,000 hands of like three handed 200 and now, and I was winning it like six BB or something in those like reg only games. And like you, I you could literally like say a random screen name, and I go, oh yeah, he's like leaking here, here, here. This is what he's doing wrong. But like you gotta. Like you say, George, you go to you, you go to high stakes, and uh, you're like, well, you know, where where's your edge against this guy? And quite often, the answer is against the best guys. Like there probably is none, I'm, and like especially against like the top dogs. Like yeah, Stefan, you know, you're bleeding to this guy, and it doesn't feel great. But obviously, like you're trying to put yourself in winning games, and uh, yeah, if 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 the game is Stefan, Linus, Marcus, Dud, and some guy who's barely a fish like you're obviously like completely punting by playing that one probably <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and even if you find leak it's, it, it, you find I, i've i've found fake 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 leaks before from yes some of these guys yeah it's like leak and then two months later you're like oh fuck i actually understand now like i wasn't actually making anything at all from this yeah exactly um, just checking um another question here which was what drives you to keep moving forward? This is from Jacob. Yeah. Um, you said, he said, he said, what drives you to keep moving forward given you already achieved everything that's possible on your sites? It's a bit presumptuous, but um, yeah. Well, you got well I mean, the we're, we're going to have combined pools soon. I don't know sure when. I don't think it's going to be like in the next few weeks or anything, but I know that there's more opportunity ahead. You know, even though my pool is segregated right now, it's not going to be for much longer. Um, and so there will be probably bigger games running more often, better players potentially to play against more recreationals too. But, um, I know that, you know, just because the work may be done now in a way, I shouldn't even say that it's not, there's still more to come and I'm not like set for life or anything. So I still want to keep making money. So, um, that's what drives me. I still love playing poker. I love the freedom it gives me. And I, I just really love the lifestyle I get to live now. Um, yeah. and I would rather not lose that. Um, I would say like one of my biggest fears in life has just been like, even back when I graduated college or university or whatever you want to call it was just, you know, not was just being broke, like not being able to like, Oh, pay for my, pay my bills and afford to do things. And that still kind of motivates me to this day, I guess, even though I'm doing fairly well in that department, but, um, and, uh, you know, again, so it's just wanting to stay on top and wanting to get better and just knowing that I still can get better. Like I know if I played in a game with all the big B coaches, I would just be absolutely slaughtered. So it's like, I want to get to where maybe I can say I could hang, hang with you guys. I mean, maybe if that never, if that ever happens, I don't you know, probably not, but there's still, you know, I can get better. And like, maybe what if we have a global pool one day? I want to be able to at least hang in those games too. Yeah. Um, and my, my mindset, so I'm very, I don't want to say I'm reactive in that sense. I try to like, and I prepare, I believe that, you know, preparing properly is, paramount for anything that you want to do so you know i don't want to sit in a game and not feel prepared regardless of the game um so that just that, i guess that's a lot of what motivates me now is just knowing that i i can and need to get better i'm not anywhere near a finished product i don't yeah. think i ever will be but yeah i think it's a very very good answer and also i would say like in the very first bit beat podcast we did maybe with the jericho um he said something which like completely resonated with me at the time when he was like this is your 20s or your 30s, maybe, nearly. Um, but he's I like, just yeah, turned 30s. So. <laughs> yeah, so for you, it's your 30s. And he's yeah. like, this is like, you're given all this time in like supposedly the best years of your life to like this game. And if you don't try, like what's the point, you know, like yeah, you don't want to spend so many hours of your life just being like, yeah, I'll show up, mate. Hope the fish busts another stack and I win like 75% of what I should have won against the fish because didn't really care what he was doing. I was just waiting for pocket aces. Um, and like it... I've had troubles with this at times and like gone through lacks of motivation. But I think like, if you're not trying, it, it's just so everyone I know who kind of gave up trying to improve at poker end up hating the game because like, it's just, it's just not fun to show up every day and just hope that things go well for you. And like, 
just hope that your game plan as it is is, is yeah. enough to stave off all the guys who are improving every day like you said in your blog like everyone else is the aggregate of your opponents is getting better so you've got to do something to to say that yeah but yeah I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. I just I hate the feeling of like getting into a situation and not being ready for it. Yeah. If you will. So it's like, you know, if I sit in a game and I'm just like, I get into situations, I'm like, I don't know what to do. It's like, yeah. I don't like that. I mean, I, I, like I said, am I am I a perfect am I perfect? Absolutely not. I mean, I still have a lot to work on. I, I would say I'm, I'm not. I mean, you said I could probably get you stake for like one K and poker stars, but like, I mean, that's still in that case, I could still get a lot better than that. I'm nowhere yeah, near yeah. like again. This by I see into you. Yeah. Although you have to know, I, I'm, I, I'm very nitty with my staking as well. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm not. Do you say that? I mean, maybe I believe it. I don't know. I know 1K and size is relatively, it's a fairly tough game, but yeah. I don't know. I guess I could still, I need to get to the point where you take me for 40K before I really feel like I've made it, I guess. And I'm nowhere yeah. near that. So, maybe he's, I mean, we need to call the boys and to stake you for 40K as well. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. But I would also say as well to anyone watching, like in Europe, obviously poker is like the, the dream is still out. You can make like a very good um, career from like almost from scratch still. But if you're American, obviously like the upside of like your, like the, the globe, the, the like full state by state pool is going to be so huge. Um, and like, it, I think I posted ages ago on Bitby. I was like, if you want to be a millionaire in a couple of years and you're like being uh, 100 now on, on American regular sites, come, come join Bitby. And like, I still kind of stand by that, like, uh, if obviously you have to work very very hard but like the upside is is still there i, I think um when you're the thing have... is none of like the biggest states that have joined yet so if and when that happens i mean we still have california new york texas yeah yeah i mean texas their wife seen going but i mean or florida too for that matter like once those states i would imagine they will i mean just a matter of time yeah. and, but... and it's about positioning yourself for that as well like you're yeah. like, like you you've been like getting obviously like yeah you you spent so much time and effort like improving now and like the future EV is insane from this. Like if even if you assign like a fifty percent probability to it happening, and like yeah, I think like yeah, well, I, I, I'm not going to name this guy. He's a rag in my pool. Plays a lot of hands, and he's a kind of a good example of what I didn't want to become because he started out. He did very well in the beginning. I think he still does well now, but he like he's got to the point where like he might have been one of the better players or best players before, but he's he doesn't ever study. He just puts in a bunch of hands and like. He's not someone I've ever thought was that tough. Like, I, I quite frankly don't think he's very good, but um, he's good to the point now where people are getting better and he isn't. And he now has very, has to really start game selecting to like, like I know when I show up, he like doesn't, a lot of times I see him just quit a session when I show up. He just yeah. doesn't want to play with me. Yeah. Um, and so I don't want to feel like I ever have to do that. And yeah. I, you know, I think like I, I, it was, there was this like uh, chart that I saw, like I think the Wacko did a few years, like a year or so ago where it was like, there's two players, you have the grinder and the investor. And the grinder just kind of does the same thing over and over again, plays the same state, doesn't ever study, puts in a lot of volume. And then you have the investor who started out at a lower state, plays less hands, but studied and got better. And eventually he's moving up the stakes to the point where after like a year or two, the investor playing less hands made more money than the grinder did. Yeah. And that's kind of how I view it too. It's like, you know, you can put all these hands in and make all this money, but if you're not getting better, you know, then what do you... <laughs> It, yeah, you, you can make money now. But what are you going to do in two years? Yeah. We've seen this so many times in BitBio, obviously Patrick as well. This exact graph play out, where it's like, yeah, um, it always pays in the end. Um, I think. Yeah, and I think that yeah, I like the analogy as well. Yeah, I um, think like live poker is kind of an extension of this in a way. Like if you think about um, like like live games, there's like kind of not enough regs or not uh, not enough competition between regs relative to recreational players oh, yeah. where like the regs actually have to like get good if that makes sense because they can just be like pretty bang average and the money's coming in their direction anyway it's yeah, like it's game select i mean yeah exactly yeah. right um and this is a little bit like uh i would say like regulated pools are probably somewhere in between um you can coast much more in the, compared to the EU pools, I guess, if you, yeah, exactly, if you don't care because, about like, maximizing it. Correct, yeah. So if you've got someone who's lazy and they're just like not trying or whatever, they're just uh, they, they're going to fall behind eventually, right? Yeah, but they survive yeah. a lot longer. I Correct, think. Yeah. But, yeah. Actually, our best bud, Solo Poker, um, <laughs> I, like to I like to translate his Instagram stories from Spanish to English. And he posted one today where he said there's like, he literally said what you're saying, Patrick, but he said, there's like a new character in live games who's like the 14, 10 
uh, 2% free bet guy. And like he wins, he like survives, you know, whereas online this guy's gone, he's, he's like yeah. instantly killed. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, it's like easy. You can be that guy and you'll make okay money for a year. But obviously like if this is what you're going to do in your 30s, like it's not, <laughs> I mean, playing 40 and 10 in live games for your 30s, is not the dream, honestly. No. Also um, like, oh my God, how can you actually like even stay awake playing that strategy? Like I'd really be on suicide watch personally. <laughs> like, <laughs> <you're> like, <laughs> <laughs> you're playing like three hands an hour or something in you know <laughs> yeah I, I it's funny like i i play live poker now and i'm just like i don't know how these guys who do this for a living for 50 hours a week can do this i just can't anymore <laughs> yeah how did you find um the experience in vegas then i guess we can kind of transition into this um yeah like, I, if you want to talk about that i mean now, the main like, event was fun I, I honestly i played a half hour of cash like, i sat a 510 game at the the king's room at paris and it was like a terrible game and i was just like it was my first night there i was like i'm just gonna play some my poker for the main to like get used to the you know playing life poker you know in terms of like you know shuffling your chest placing bats not being a tell box whatever and I played for like a half hour and I barely played. Like I think I played like two hands. I was like, this game is horrendous. I'm just going to leave and I'd rather not be doing this. And I didn't play a single hand of cash besides after that. I just played the main. Because to be fair, the next day was day one D of the main, played that. Um, I think I played like a Venetian 1100 on between my day one and day two. Didn't cash that. Um, I had a buddy who tried to, you told me the 10, 20, and 20, 40 at Bellagio was good. But I, uh, I saw the list was long. So I just said, I'm just going to. I guarantee I'm probably not going to get a seat if who knows if the game's good. Um, so I didn't play that. And then the next four days was main event. <laughs> it was basically wake up at nine, go get breakfast, walk over to the Valley's Paris, play till midnight and repeat it um, for those next four days. And so it wasn't any time to play cash. And then after the main, I think I played like two tournaments. Like I played the win mystery value, I fired two bolts in that, wrecked them, played the 800 deep stack. Um, I just realized I wanted to come home. So, uh, I mean, yeah. you said that like, how's the overall experience in Vegas it was awesome. I don't regret it at all. I you know, can't wait to play the main again next year. And it's actually kind of funny. I, uh, I mentioned this in my blog and in, in the Bippy server, but I was at a bachelor party. I don't know if you guys do this for when people get, someone gets married, like you go out and party with your friends, like one last yeah. hurrah. Yeah. Um, so I had one of those the weekend before I left for Vegas and, um, about an hour or so north of where I'm from. And so my friends, there's me, David, another friend who was driving. We're driving back and they're like, oh yeah, you excited to go to Vegas? Because it was like, I we drove back and the next day I was flying out. And I was telling them, I was like, honestly, not really. <laughs> like, I don't, like I'm going to play the main, that's kind of cool. But like, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't really, wasn't that excited about it. And it's kind of funny how it worked out because I went out there like borderline not wanting to be there. And then I ended up running deep in the main. So maybe I should have that attitude every time I go. But <laughs> uh, going back to that, I mean, it, I'm glad it worked out the way it did and kind of made me realize like, Hey, maybe I should try to be a little more positive when thinking about these things, because, you know, Hey, I, had I not gone, you know, had I used my, you know, said, Hey, I screw this. I don't want to go. I'm not going. I would have missed out on a lot of cool experiences. Um, and also there's so many people that would just kill to be able to do what I did, you know, flying out to Vegas to play the world series of poker main event. Like it's a bucket list. I have so many people. It's like, maybe I should be a little more, have a little more gratitude and be thankful for the fact that I get to do that. Um, and like I said, I mean, I think I mentioned I, I had some very cool experiences. I mean, day one, I get moved tables and I set my chips down. I look across the table and Phil Ivy sitting there and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> holy shit. All right. <laughs> this is fucking cool. Um, yeah. And it's funny because on dinner break, him? my you know what? I said, did, did you bluff him? I, well, I did. I won one pot where like he <laughs> opened and I defended BB and then he checked, five point check, check. And then I probe turn and he folded. Oh, feast, like, I had feast, a gutter and one, I, I had a gutter and an ace, so I was like, I was yeah. Good and yeah, he like kind of eyeballed me and then folded. And then I like immediately went to Discord, like I just bought Phil Ivy. <laughs> Probably the best hand, but I don't even care. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, that was um, no. Those were I mean, the experiences I gained, and I got going back. I was gonna say, so my friend Brad and I went to dinner on uh, dinner break, and. He's like, he asked me, he's like, do you like, do you get like, do you think it's cool when you see all these like pros around the series? And I looked at it, I was like, not really. Like, I'm not, I came here to make money and like to play in the main event, like to do what I do. Like, I'm not, I, I saw a lot of these guys last year and they're just like, whatever to me now. And then two and a half hours later, I, you know, had to take that statement back. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of funny how that worked. But yeah. it's um, funny you mentioned the gratitude thing because I had my first experience of the World Series this year myself and like, 
uh, I was lucky enough to run deep in the 5k six max, which is like my first ever world series event. And like, uh, I had this, yeah, this funny experience where like the whole time I was just like very grateful to be there doing what I'm doing, like playing high stakes tournaments and, uh, yeah, being able to do this for a living and just being so comfortable at the table around, like you say, like these recognized names. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, on day two or three, I don't know which, I was playing with like Dean Eggs and Lucky Chewy and stuff and like just talking to them at the table and Lucky Chewy was like, oh yeah, I've seen you run it once videos, like I like them and this kind of stuff. And I was just like, wow, this is fucking strange. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, but it makes you yeah. very, very grateful. Yeah, um, I mean, like, I think if like anything, it kind of like validates the work you've put in yeah you know no like going back to like i mean like, almost going back to like the contribute to society topic that we talked about maybe kind of a different you know it's a little different but it's like you know at least it gives you some validation there yeah um but but as a yeah. place vegas is very strange i would say like yeah I, I i can't do it for more than four or five days now no, i just i don't like walking down the street and seeing all these homeless people and these flamingo girls and fake cops it's like okay like i don't want to take a picture i'm not paying you to like you know, take, take a picture. It's just like, get it, leave me alone. Like, damn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess in a, in a way we're very lucky though, that we have the option to like leverage our online poker skills. You know what I mean? Not have to, yeah. not have to be set in the casinos the whole time. Yes. Um, yeah. Like that was the thing too. I mean, there, were, you mentioned about the big experience. Like I didn't play a lot of cash. Cause like, quite frankly, when I wasn't playing poker, like the tournaments, I didn't want to be playing poker. Like I was like, I'm going to go like, you know, eat some nice food or just go for a walk. Or like, I don't want to sit there in a dark casino and, you know yeah be yeah missing this is, out on other things in life this is the one thing i've always thought i struggled with like i really want to play the main event one year but it's like las vegas it's like you're so close to like yosemite you know like death valley yeah. like even San, even like the um the, the coast between san francisco and la and stuff like this and you've got like all these like beautiful places which i would like love to visit and like i'm in this like 50 degree city Set in a casino with air conditioning and no windows. I think like I was I just say, if, you're, if you're trying to play the main event, you're not going. To, you're not doing any of those things. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I struggle. I would struggle to stay for long. I think but, it's yeah. funny because that my the one friend he he made day five of the main last year, and he kind of told me he's like, dude, like it was almost a it was uh, he's like I was honestly relieved when it was over because it's all day <laughs> every day. I mean, like, and to be fair, like I, I almost felt the same way. Like the next day, I woke up and I thought I'd be like crushed, and I was like, okay, like I don't what do I, I get to do whatever I want to do with my day now? Sure, I'm not playing for ten million dollars anymore, but my freedom's back. And like, yeah, it's like the main event. It's literally all day every day, whenever. Yeah. Day. So that makes it crazy. Like on day seven, they made them play to like seven a.m. It's like, are you yeah, kidding? So, I would have like, I would have been throwing a fit at that point. I was like, this is ridiculous. We've been playing. We've played like seventy-five hours in ten days. Like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah, yeah. They they wanted to get down to the final table. They played till seven a.m. and they had ten. Yeah. And they so finally said, all right, let's call. Like, you know, you guys yeah. can go back on Friday. Mate, it's like, just 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 if you're the big stat, you just leave. Just walk off and go to bed and be like, yeah, I'll come back. Yeah. It's <laughs> like this is. Like, I just remember saying, like, I, I cannot believe they made them play that long. Like, it's so inhumane because of how like. My experience, like I was pretty, you know, day five, I was relatively tired. I, was, I can't imagine having to play, two, you know, yeah. another full day and then that day too. It's like, and the stakes that land at this point are just insane as well. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I understand you have TV schedules, but like, let's think about the human beings for a second here. Like, yeah. I don't know if you guys heard the story. Apparently, someone died because they played two days straight. They played a cash game session where it was two days straight. I think they were 30, so they were my age. Yeah. They didn't leave the table for two days and they just hard to die. This could happen to my housemate, Frank, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out! I've sometimes I've sometimes gone to bed when he's grinding and woke up in the morning and then he's just still sat there. Um, but yeah, shout out to that. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, one one thing I was going to ask about actually, just because I just randomly remembered, is this hand where someone folded pocket queens to pre flop in the main event. This is oh, like a legendary yeah. one. But this oh, one, that was is funny. This, does, is this like expected or what? I mean, I've never played these. So games. I mean, the guy it was just weird. Like, I had I think I had like Jackman suit, and the guy was like clearly a weaker player, and we were like 70, 80 blinds deep. So like I'm just I'd rather I could complete and let the guy on my left who was a solid player, and the, like, I was like I could complete, but like I'd rather just isolate this guy myself and kind of get him heads up. Um, so I three bet, and like he didn't he thought about it for like I, mean, I wouldn't say like, he didn't even think really. It was like two or three seconds. <laughs> And he flipped him over like the queens, and he folded. And like I said, I had Jack Nine suit. I was just like, "Huh? Like what? Oh, okay. this is like okay. small blind versus button, right? Just like it was small three. blind, no versus like hijack. Like I said, it was okay. just like totally getting out of line. But I'm like, I'm just this guy's a recreational. He's tight. I'm just gonna take. I would rather just get him heads up, and I very likely won the pot. Classic um, so, race fold with queens. Well, yeah. Well, well, yeah. And then the hand where this is ridiculous. I mean, I think 
I'm, I, I don't know if the guy, the German guy's going to be watching this, but like, it was like close to the money bubble. I mentioned the guy off had like a 700 K hijack opens. He with the 700 K stack, that same guy in the small blind calls. And then the big blind just rips like 50 some bigs. So it was like, it was like 200, 300 K, which was, I, I thought was kind of insane because the one stack had him well covered. So like, he's just, he's trying to apply ICM pressure in a spot where like he doesn't, Really have the stack to do it. I don't think. I mean, this might be. I don't know. Um, raise original razor folds, and then the guy, the small blind, the same guy tanks for like five minutes and ends up folding queens again. And we're just like the entire, like the entire team. We're all like, dude, are you kidding me? Like he does not ever have you beat there. Wait, is he this, never is has this, kings. He never has aces. Ever. Is this the same? Is this the same guy? Yeah, same, same guy. guy. And he was like, well, it's fifteen grand to mid cash, and no, no, no. I'm sitting there like, dude, you paid ten to get. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, but this yeah. is yeah. this is why the main is so soft every year, right? Oh, yeah. Because you've got these guys playing, and then like, uh, like it might be the first and only perhaps time they ever play this tournament, and like it actually yeah. means a lot to them to be like, yeah, I cashed the World Series main, you know? Literally, um, and it's it's funny. Like even on day four and five, I saw these two older guys. Just complete like they played for like four or five days and they just completely lit their stacks on fire bust. It's like you see these things. It's like they're doing this. It's like you just played four days to do that. Are you kidding me? Like what are you doing? Yeah, but that, that's what makes it a great tournament. You get you you know it's an endurance test. You get a lot of you, you see people from all different walks of life and all you know you see the top pros. You see recreationals. You see guys that won their poker league at home. Um, if that's what makes it great, I mean, it's just you know, all the people you get to play against and see. And you got pocket pocket queens. This guy's special trick of folding pocket queens. Um, Twice. I mean, the yeah. one open. And then he asked me, he's like, "Do you have aces or kings?" And I wanted. I was just like, I can't. Answer I mean, that. there's literally <laughs> no way I don't show him jack nine. I respect that, it. Way. Oh, nah, you got. You don't want to do it. Dude, I had two tougher guys on my left. The last thing I needed to see them to see was me three betting jack nine suit. They were just because <laughs> like, yeah. they had me covered too. I was like, I'm not trying to like, <laughs> not doing that. All right, we got another question um, here, which says. What percent of moving up to the nose, please, in 2022 would you say is grinding sims and being able to execute the knowledge you've gained? So I would say, firstly, that's just like if you want to move up to, to the nose, please, if we're saying nose, please, is like 40k plus, like a lot of it is about connections because, like, or, or, or how degenerate you are because, like, how do you move? It's, it's hard to like grind like a what, like a four million dollar bankroll. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're not that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but like, and then like. So if we if we call it like moving to like five k ten k, um, instead five k now ten k now not five k slash ten k. I mean, um, yeah. For me, I don't think ten k is happening this year um, unless I saw which again I just don't like doing. Um, I mean, I think a, a, it's a lot of sim work, and I think for me, it, it's using it the right way, and that's a tribute I think to you guys. You really have taught me a lot in terms of how to use how to a tool because. At the end of the day, that's what it is. It's not like you can sit there and, you know, pull up a sim and just completely execute exactly what it tells you to execute. But, like, understanding the concepts and the ideas behind what it's doing and why it's doing it um, is very crucial. And that's kind of, like, whenever I look at a sim, that's really what I try to find is just, okay, like, I think you guys see one of the questions I asked, like, why is this happening? And, like, how can I apply it to other situations? Yeah. Um, and how can I apply it in game more than, like, okay, like, let's just see this. All right, I'm going to start doing it. Like I'm just gonna do exactly what it's what how it is because you just can't do that. I mean, like I was thinking as well, like of the of the like the top guys, uh like 5k plus, like the very good players, you can also say this, Patrick. I don't think I'm just thinking like the guys that I would like that I, I really don't like to play against. So say like Sir Helmet, um, Duddy, Ospiel, uh Vrora, um, um Stefan Marcus Lyons, obviously, uh Davy Jones. There's not a single one of them who you would say is like copying bio. Right. No. Like the, the strategies don't the I mean, way they play in game doesn't look anything like Pyrus over Jet. Not generally. in not in a they're following the line because they want to replicate the exact strategy or the exact output, right? Like, yeah, not at all. They're obviously studying with it like every day or multiple times a week yeah, or whatever, yeah. but they're yeah. not replicating anything. But yeah. It's not exactly. like a case of like grinding sims because like the volume of like spots isn't what helps you. It's like looking at a limited amount of spots and looking like what drives the interaction like, are those forces at play in the games I'm playing are these forces at play in this hand and if they're not how does it change what my yeah. strategy should look like to extract most EV exactly um, yeah yeah I think like for me when I first joined I'm not going to say too much about how like Marcus plays but like that was like one of the things that stood out to me was like seeing how he like I, I came in thinking okay this guy is just 
you put Pia, you, you put him and Pia on a game, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference. And like, like that's just not true. But that's yeah, the thing like, yeah. that stood out to me. It was like when I, you know, saw his, like how he thinks about the game and saw some of his answers and like, you know, watching those group coaching. It's like, all right, so he's, he's not Pio basically. <laughs> like he's, he's doing something different. And that, you know, to me, that was like, okay, like maybe I've been trying to do this all wrong by trying to copy Pio. Yeah. Because and then this Barry, guy's not doing it. Why very sweet. Trying? Like Barry Sweet is maybe the best example of this whole where he like played the, the top guys, you know, and then like was on his own, his own madness. And like it, it, I think it's very difficult, like for, for, for like, yeah, if you think that poker is about executing sims to understand how he could play the way he did and like have these results against like the people who are supposedly um, copying five, obviously not, but yeah. It's like a very interesting facet of poker to me, I think. And like all these guys who like really made it at the highest stakes, um, I, I think there's like a common trend of like someone behind them who like really understood how to um, approach poker in, in this way. Like I think like, I know that like uh, D- Duddy and like Barack, obviously, who had very good results as well, both came from the Yuri Peleg stable. He's got a couple of other ones there. Um, like, obviously, most of us had like interaction with Marcus, some interactions with Linus and, and Daryl. And then the, the, the sickest one of all, I think, which is a story which basically no one knows, is the, um, the old internet stable, um, who he had a study group before Bio was even released. Uh, he had a stable, which was Marcus, Big Blind Bets, Limitless. Um, can't think who else. And they were all playing like 200 now. And they um, obviously had a relatively large amount of success, I would say. Um, <laughs> from that. But they, they, they like the same thing. Like it was just real. These guys like Yuri Peleg, uh, uh, Internet, um, et cetera. Like they've really understood like what, what like drives EV basically, which is a big difference. Like how a lot of people approach the game, I think. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of ways to use pyo really inefficiently which gain you almost zero ev and very few ways to use it efficiently which will gain you genuine ev i think and some of these aren't necessarily intuitive if someone yeah i mean yeah i think yeah yeah i I would just say like yeah grinding sims is not the path basically think more about like where like your, your aim is to make money so think about how you make money and try and improve that is what is the the yeah, I remember a conversation I had with he posted a lot of like the two plus two of the like strategy forums and it was a handy post that I think he kind of butchered and like I this was like a year ago I like went in and like I think I don't know why you're doing this because of this this and this not really gaining anything and he goes he basically at the end said like yeah I don't think it gains me anything I'm just gonna do it anyways because I think I, I want to try and make it more complicated and I'm like okay then like <laughs> if you want to sure man like go for it like, i think it's easy to forget game anything, but sure why not like, yeah it's easy to forget the game forget the game you're playing like fetishize like hitting certain frequencies or lines or whatever and forget like i mean i've been very guilty of this and forget like that the game you're playing is to to try and win money or ev at least yeah um yeah. just i know you've got to go shortly don but uh we have a few more questions if you yeah. you're good for 10 more minutes or so yeah 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 cool um which are wait i'm scrolling through the the list now someone said can you talk about we've kind of done it already but can you talk about tilt longevity and the importance of turning up every day even when things are going well but you don't feel like it aren't going well but you don't feel like it yeah also, but- I'm sorry, I'll just add the second. The second part actually is maybe better to address because we talked a bit about this. He said, yeah. when you guys were coming up, how was your approach towards spending money? So like, <laughs> yeah, how do you, yeah. Like spending money in terms of like, just like life everyday things or like coaching or? Oh yeah, I mean, like everything basically. <laughs> like life expenses, uh, spending. So, I mean, there's very different approaches to this in the poker world, I think. Yeah, it's funny. I think my friends would have a interesting answer to this. <laughs> Maybe how I've become. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned before. I like always feared not being able to afford my bills or to be able to like, support myself. And so, like, first and foremost, I try to make sure like everything I have is you know I need to pay for is paid for. And so, like, if I do spend money on frivolous things, vacations, whatever, it's some money that I can afford to spend, and it's not really taking too much out of my bankroll. Um, and it's like kind of funny a conversation I had with a. Uh, poker guy who was an adversary at the beginning but then has become a, a good friend of mine through the poker community or world we were having a conversation and he was just like he basically told me like you know sometimes you know in this game you got to treat yourself and you got to like you know spoil yourself and like because you work so hard and you know and then you have success like you have to like you know enjoy it so 
I've kind of gotten into like I've become a sneakerhead. Me and another guy in the group named Chris, we both kind of go back and forth with some of the different like Jordans that we buy. Um, <laughs> so like I like Jordan fours and the Jordan ones. <laughs> yeah, I just I like I, it was funny. I, during the bachelor party, there was a draw for two separate Jordan. Like there was like a Jordan one low and a Jordan one high, and I got both of them. Oh, man, let's go. This is awesome. So I got, I got my collection up to like 17 or 18, I think, but uh, in the last like eight months, but yeah. um, I mean, I like, and the, yeah, I, mean, I, I like to golf. So I buy, I bought a couple different pair. I, I, I'll buy my, I'll spend money on golf clubs, like golf shoes. I buy, you know, golf balls aren't cheap. So I buy a lot of those. I mean, cause I have to, um, for me though, I try to just, you know, it's things I enjoy and things I know I can afford is the main thing. Um, because you know, the life short, you only get a little bit once. You might as well, if you are able, you might as well try and to enjoy it. Um, and I think that's something I say, if you are able to enjoy it, I think that's one thing I would advise people. If you can't afford to do it, don't do it. Yeah. Um, I used to not, I mean, I would like my friends can even try to test this back when I was working my job. And I think my best year was like $50,000 a year is what I made. And I wasn't buying a lot of frivolous stuff. I did because I couldn't. I had to pay my bills. I had to pay my rent. You know? Um, I, I've lived within my means, but, um, yeah, I mean, like I say, <laughs> if you're asking like the stuff I buy, it's stupid stuff like shoes and bought a nice Apple watch when I won a tournament. Splashing so, out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like these things are like three or four bucks, but I got like this cool strap. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like 900, but. Well, it may be. It's it. 900. <laughs> yeah, like I want it. It's cool. Yeah. Oh, like, it looks bougie. It looks cool. Yeah. Why not? I'm going to get it. So. <laughs> I think I, I really agree though with this, like living within your means thing. And I think like there's, there's nothing that like, I find like less impressive than the guy who's got like the like Versace top, but you know is like like that's like I don't know one tenth of his yearly income. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, um, but yeah. And I also think as poker players, you have to also respect that you're um, like if you earn like a hundred k through poker, let's say, it's not the same as earning a hundred k in a real job because your longevity is so much more uncertain. Mm-hmm. Like normally, if you're in like a corporate job, a hundred k, you can be pretty sure of a career for like x years into the future whereas with poker that's not the case and i think it's a mistake i see a lot of people making it also you, the job is so stressful playing poker you don't want to add to the stress with like by making your financial situation more precarious through like expenditure yeah um, at least that's my opinion but i'm also renowned for being on the nidia side i would guess <laughs> with this stuff um i like think one of my first yeah. coaches i with donald he talked about like we we're talking like risk aversion and all that. And he's like, you know, George. And I was like, yeah, the coach, right? And he goes, he is a nit. And he just went out and how much of a nit you are. I was like, yeah. Man. I think I, I, it's, 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 I like, I like played like. He's, like, he's one of the biggest nits I know. He, he, he can yeah. be aggressive when it comes to poker, but in life, he is just such yeah, a nit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I've been like slowly converted now because obviously, like, uh, uh, the guys I'm around the whole time. But I mean, I still, I, I, I still think like I knew my mental game was like, you have to know yourself too. And if you know you're going to struggle with swings, like you want to, like I said, minimize the effect they have on you by like making sure you're very well rolled for sticks. But yeah, I mean, I probably took it a bit far. I think I was, I was playing 200 and I of like, like 300 binds or something at one point. No, no sorry. Sorry, 3,000 binds, maybe. Um, I'll say, so like if you have 300, you're like, in my mind, you're fully rolled for 500 and now. And you're nah, still yeah. I, I mean, like I was, I was on the very extreme side, I think. And even now, like I know, like when I play like 40K or whatever, um, I like, <laughs> take like i know people who take that much take take all of themselves who have like significantly less money than me for example but yeah i just think it's is a case of knowing yourself and it is also a case of like making sure you factor in like what can happen like what what the outcomes are and like how happy you'll be in each one yeah yeah. i mean to be fair i I would say i'm very nitty with bankroll too um i mean i i'm kind of the same like i don't sell any action and i like i i my shot taking threshold is a little bit higher than others like those people say 40 50 buy-ins is you know, they'll start shot taking in mind. I don't even, I do more than that. Um, because I mean, I, I do think it's true that you need to be comfortable with stakes you're playing and like, you know, the money you have in front of you, you can't worry about losing it. You know, you can't be saying like, Oh man, if I lose this, like, what am I going to do? It's like, you have to just be able to rifle it in there with you zero percent equity. You just... the decisions, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to be able to just rifle, you have to rifle the entire stack in there for, you know, with nothing to, to because you know, it's the correct thing to do to be playing well. Yeah, and yeah. now if you lose it, Life's gonna be okay. Yeah, it's funny though because there are guys who will genuinely be fine if they like go broke and just grind it back up, and that like wouldn't bother them or yeah. whatever. Like in all, like they would take big risks now, and like if they went bust, they went bust, and they'd be like, "It is what it is." We'll, we get back to the grindstone or whatever. But like, sounds kind of like the bad Berkey, like 
strategy. Like, it seems like that's just like, he, cause he always felt like he could get backing. So he's like, I'm just going to fire. And if I break, okay, I'll just get more backing. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, it's probably, it's probably Max EV, right? Like oh, yeah. the old Kelly criterion. But I think like, you, you don't want like Patrick said, being, you don't want to maximize for monetary outcome. You want to maximize for like your, your enjoyment and happiness in life. And like, yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if I lost everything, I would not be, you know, um, <laughs> I would not be, even if I was staked playing like 5k, but fully staked now. I well, the thing is yes, too, what if that running. runs out eventually? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I, I, to me, I'm just someone, I, I almost, I don't want to say I take pride in doing things myself, but it's like, it feels better if you grind it up all on your own without like having to ask others to like, I mean, obviously I asked you guys for help with coaching, but it's like, I did it with my money and like my, you know, I didn't have to ask, you know, for a loan or anything. And yeah. I think like loaning money and getting to that kind of game or like getting loan money and loaning people money, it's just, too tricky of a game to play it's a dangerous game to play especially yeah, in yeah yeah I mean, there's very few people i would like loan money to in life period to be honest with you um because i mean i, I think we're, we're in bit b we've probably loaned money to um <laughs> i mean we, we have a lot of a lot of money loaned to various people but yeah i agree with you in general um but i think it's just <laughs> uh, calculation do as um, i say not as i do right <laughs> yeah Let's just, yeah. just, just just to wrap up um, quickly. Then I just saw Hunter asked a few questions, so um, oh jeez, we'll pick we'll pick we'll pick we'll pick one of them, um, and then we'll wrap up. Can so. I just put a picture up if, to his question? I have like a picture we can just put up. <laughs> if you my response to that tweet, that's the picture I want to put up. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I didn't ask that one. Um, he said um, one. Th- let's go. Let's just go with this. I said one thing you wish you had known before taking the jump into being a professional poker player um everything you guys taught me no. <laughs> yeah. uh, um i don't know i mean i, I guess i know there wasn't anything that comes to mind um maybe that i should ask for help sooner get coaching sooner would be the one thing i guess yeah that you know I, that'd be the main thing but um so if i guess someone is taking the plunge i would say you know invest in yourself early as early as you can because you know, each month you're not getting better. Or you're not investing in yourself. It's just one month longer it's going to take to, to get better. And it's one of those things that's like kind of like an investment. It kind of it compounds on itself. So the sooner you start getting better, you know, towards the end, you know, it only it'll, it starts compounding quicker, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah and it results also start skyrocketing quicker. So it's delayed gratification. That was a hard thing to, it's like human brain doesn't really oh, like doing yeah. this, like sacrificing early to make more gains later on. So. What about you, Patrick? One thing you wish you'd learned before you played professional poker? Mm, fuck. Uh, one thing I'd learn or like one attribute well, you, I you, had? <laughs> one thing you, I think the question is, that's quite exactly you said. One thing you wish, wish you had known. Um, yeah. Your opponents aren't as good as you might think they are. I think like having too much respect when you're moving up the stakes is a dangerous thing uh until you actually get to the top and then yeah yeah like having too much respect for people like if you look at like if you uh, imagine how stefan would play like 100 nl like the the shit that you would see is like you wouldn't believe your eyes right um and i think like disrespecting people within reason is probably the correct way to move up stakes i would argue which is yeah, something because, I didn't do enough of. Uh, See, I actually, that's know. funny you mentioned that because I remember when I started playing like two five live in Detroit, I had this like grinder red guy jam like three x pot on me on a straight board. I had a set, and I like thought he had bluffs or like worse. <laughs> so like it was like yeah. middle set, and I called and I was like, now that I think about it, it's like when he did that, that is just like never ever 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 not this is just straight because that's just what it is right like yeah he jammed 3x pot and he's playing 2-5 live like what do you think he has like but like i thought like oh he's 2-5 player he's probably so sick you know he's he's, you know, um, he's, he's a 500 hour reg mate you've got to he's, I think he, played five, he played 500 yeah. soon like yeah. <laughs> it's, this honestly like the, mo- the most famous hand for this of all time is if you look up uh otb versus kanu where like otb just like jam like literally 10x pot or something on the river and obviously Kano had bluff catcher and he was like, fuck me, it's OTB, can't forward. And like, um, yeah, OTB, even you see this at 500 zoom, just like if he had the good hands, he was going all in. Everyone's like, yeah, mate, it's OTB, got to call him down. 
Um, I, I yeah. also remember OTV's thread when he was playing 500 Zoom and he was doing like tracking his winnings on a month or doing some kind of prop bet or something like this. And there were hands where he was just like five bet jamming like 10. I remember he like five bet ripped 10, five suited in some spot against some guy and got a fold and just like actually taking the disrespect to the next level, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I was thinking about this because my first instinct as well is to say that like the thing I wish I'd learned no, sorry, was that like it will be all right because I had like so much stress and anxiety, like yeah. in times where I was like, will I make like enough money to support myself? Like, is it a good decision or whatever? Like, is like poker gonna be like the right thing to sacrifice all my time for? Which, like, if I'd have known it would turn out okay, it would obviously have been a lot worse. But then I was thinking as well, like, linked to what Patrick said, like, both these things, like, it will be all right, and like your opponents aren't good. Um, if you don't, if you knew them, you lose a bit of drive to improve, I think. Like a lot of the reason I like tried so hard to get better or like to, to build bit B properly was because I was like, maybe it won't be all right. Or like maybe my opponents are, are working just as hard as me. Like, it's almost like, I think once you start, like, yeah, part of, part of like getting good is having respect for people as well. <laughs> like you have to like, make sure that you, you like work, work as hard as you possibly can to make sure no one's working as hard as you. And yeah. um, it kind of goes so, back to like maybe my fears of like not being able to like support myself, you know? Yeah, like in that way. And that kind of, it kind of sounds like similar. Yeah. And this is like, yeah, this is what gives you the fire to like put in what you need to, to, to do what needs to be done. Because like, I think like if you're playing poker at high stakes and you're like, you have an exceptional job, basically, like the amount of money you can make is not normal. And, and like, you should respect this and like not expect to have ex exceptional results without exceptional um, effort. Like, because otherwise, like is a free market economy, like otherwise someone else will come for you eventually um yeah so yeah I, I think it's like a balance like i do wish i'd not, not had as much like stress as i had but at the same time i think like it's tough to know if there's like a butterfly effect to that and goes through mm -hmm. would you rather go back into banking or whatever you were doing before <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. definitely not yeah <laughs> definitely not all right on that note i guess dom's got to go play golf um, I do, yeah. <laughs> so we'll we'll wrap it up. But yeah, thanks a lot for coming on, Dom. Um, and I think that we'll we'll probably do another one of these podcasts in, in the near future and get get Daryl involved and and go from there. So yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Sorry to the guys whose questions we didn't get to. And um, yeah, cheers, Patrick. Cheers, Dom. Yeah, nice Good one. Thanks, guys. Thanks for yeah, having me on, man. Like I said, you guys have changed my life. So I really appreciate you yeah, too and the entire group. And it was an honor to be on. So thank you. It's been a pleasure, mate. It's been a yeah. pleasure.